I heard a story about a man who was considerably wealthy and uh, he was known in his community for being very eccentric, having big parties at his home. Well, on one occasion he was having a huge party and as the guests got there, they realized that he had emptied out his uh, Olympic-sized swimming pool. He had actual salt water from the sea brought in. He had filled his tank with all types of eels and sharks and alligators and so many things. And at the, the middle of his party, he said, he goes, well, we, we, we want to see where everybody's at at this party. If anybody is brave enough to dive in one end, to swim to the other and walk out, he goes, you name it and whatever you want in this world is going to be yours. Well, nobody took him up on the offer immediately, but somewhere in the midst of the evening, all of a sudden there is a guy in the other end and he is swimming to the other side he, with every Thing he's got. He is going not eating nothing. He is maneuvering sharks, going around alligators. At times looks a little bit out of control. When he reaches the other side, he crawls up out, grabs the thing, and look just in the nick of time, misses everything. To which the man who is the host of the party comes down from the platform where he is, and he shakes his hand and says, I want to congratulate you. And as I said, you name it and you can claim it. Whatever it is you name that you want, I'll make sure it happens. Happens. He looks at the guy and he says, the only name I want right now is the name of the guy who pushed me in. <laughs> Which maybe kind of leads us to where Jesus is going in the Sermon on the Mount. Because you know, often he wants to lead us places, but other times he kind of has to push us to the place he wants us to go. And nowhere is that seen more than in this sermon that we've been going through in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. When I last left you two weeks ago, we were in the middle of the series that we're calling Upside Down Kingdom. It is from the first and most famous sermon that Jesus ever preaches. And as I've said before, it speaks of a kingdom that is upside down. It's a kingdom that is unlike any earthly kingdom. A kingdom where the first are last and the last are first. It's a complete reversal of roles as we know it, where the greatest in the kingdom of earth is the least in the kingdom of heaven and the least in the kingdom of earth is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, as chapter 6 opens up as we began a few weeks ago, Jesus is teaching on a variety of topics, but in particular, he is preaching on the subject of prayer. And like the followers of Jesus, most of us grew up praying. Maybe you remember some of those very first prayers you prayed. See if you can follow this up. God is great. God is let us isn't it ironic that most of us know a prayer that, that probably most of us prayed from the time we were a young child? And isn't it ironic that that prayer starts almost the same way that what we call the Lord's Prayer will start? With an acknowledgement that God is great. An acknowledgement that God is good. But often as things happen in life, uh, as, as we grow up, those prayers can kind of begin to lose that upward focus and begin to focus, well, on me, my wants, my wishes, my desires. Like most of us, the men and women who had followed Jesus up the mountainside that day, they had been praying their entire lives. But there was something different about the prayer life of Jesus. There was something different about the relationship and the way that he talked to his Father in heaven. First of all, just to call him Father. So Luke, Luke tells us that uh, the followers of Jesus, that they ask him a question in Luke chapter 11. The question is this, Jesus, Lord, would you teach us to pray? That prayer is found both in Luke and in Matthew. And Matthew is when you get it in its entirety in the Sermon on the Mount. And it is a prayer that is both kind of a how-to prayer and a how-not-to prayer. As we've seen in Matthew 6, Jesus begins with the how-not-tos. Now, when you're praying, don't make a show of it. Don't pray to impress people. Don't use big words and fancy phrases, thinking God is going to hear you if you just continue to talk and you use words and phrases that no one else knows about. God is not impressed by that. Instead, Jesus says, when you pray, he says, find a quiet place, a room in which you can go. And if you can imagine in the days of Jesus, that would have been very difficult. They shared houses. Most of their houses uh, to the common person might have been a one-room or a two-room house. Often those houses were divided not by doors but by curtains. It was the wealthier people who would have had doors in their houses. But he says, you find a place. Go somewhere and get along with your heavenly Father. Close the door. I think for us, he might say, find a place away from the busyness of your life. Which can often be as difficult for us as finding 
a place to be alone was for them. Away from the noise, away from the stuff that keeps you running from this place to the next place and pray to your father. Which would have made all of them stop and think, did, did, did he just say pray to our father? I mean, we don't call him, we, uh, we call him Al Al Almighty, we call him El Shaddai, we call him provider, but, but father, we don't pray like that. And then Jesus continues, he says, at about that list of things that you pray for, you know, safe travels, good grades, good health, food, clothing a day, get me out of the trouble I've gotten myself into, and I'm your man for life, I'm your woman for life. He said, besides all of that, that list of things that you make, he says, there's something you need to know about that list to begin with. He says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Which probably left most of them scratching their heads and saying, well, the Father knows. And Father, that's just a foreign term to us anyway. If, if, if our Father, if He knows the things that we already need before we ask Him, then, then why are we praying? Which is a good question for us and for them. And, and from that question arises what we call the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. But as I've often said throughout this series, I think it will more aptly be called the disciples prayer because it is a prayer given in response to the question from Jesus disciples when they asked Jesus Jesus would you teach us to pray would you teach us to have this relationship to talk to God the way you talk to God because Jesus if you're saying that we can call God father well well that, that's the first thing I mean we don't do that and since you are right and our prayers generally are about what we need and if, and if God, I mean Father, already knows those things, then, then Jesus, why are we praying? Would you teach us? Teach us to pray. And Jesus begins this model of a disciple's prayer with the same Father language that he's been using. And to bring us up to date, he begins that prayer like this. He says, this then is how you should pray. If you want to know, then dig in, dive in, look deep. He says, start with our Father. It's this reminder that God wants an intimate, close relationship with us. Our Father in a perfect sense. For those of you who might have had earthly fathers that, that weren't someone that you think you could live up to. He says, this is not that kind of Father. He's going to go on and he's going to tell about that in a little bit. But he says, I want you to think of that perfect father, a father who never leaves, who never forsakes. You begin your prayers like that. Our father, it is a relationship in heaven, he continues. And in heaven was not so much defining a space where God lived as it was speaking about the power and the authority that God has. All authority is at his command. He speaks and the stars come out. He is the creator and the ruler of the world. All the resources you or I could ever need are at his command. And guess what he allows us to call him? Our father. And then he says, hallowed be your name. Which really, we read that and, and, and at first reading it looks like that we're just making a statement, hallowed. And we looked at that word, it means holy, holy, use your name. And while it's true, in its original language, that is actually the first petition of the prayer. It is a petition from each of us to live in such a way that we make the name of God holy. It is asking God to help me conduct myself in my life, in my business, in my school, in a way that treats God's name as sacred. It is a realization that he is holy, that he is infinite, that he is sacred, that he is not just a God who is greater than all the other gods that sometimes we uh, uh, give ourselves to or pour out ourselves for. He is different from those other gods. He is a holy, set-apart God. He needs nothing. He rules every Everything. As we sang this morning, he has no rival. He has no equal. It is putting God in his proper place and realizing who we are before him, who we are addressing. And as a prayer, it is a request for me to live in such a way that I make his name holy in my life. And that's my first petition or request in the prayer. Lord, let me live in a way that people are drawn to you, to your name. My second petition, as we looked at two weeks ago, was this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, Jesus is not just in this model prayer that he's giving us for his disciples, teaching us how to pray. He is teaching us what we need to be praying for. Pray for God's name to be restored. Pray, he says, for God's will to be done. It's realizing that in this upside-down kingdom that he's inviting us to be a part of, that in this kingdom, whose priorities are last? 
Well, it's mine. And in a world that wants to put our priorities first, well, this is not a very American Western prayer. In a world of me first, this is a prayer that says, No, Father, you first. Your name over my name. Your will over my will. Your kingdom over my kingdom. What Jesus asks us to pray is that we would make this life on earth look a little bit more like that life in heaven. A place of no sickness heaven is. So would you work to make earth a place of no sickness? Would you work to bring healing? Would you work to bring restoration? A place where there is no hunger in heaven. So would you make this earth a place where there is no hunger? A place where there is no poverty in heaven. So would you make this earth a place of no poverty? Would you work for my will? Would you work for my kingdom? Would you work for my goal? So we give ourselves to that cause. Use me, Father. To make your name known on this earth like it is in heaven. Use me, Father, to make your will done on this earth like it is in heaven. Use me, Father, to make your kingdom come. Not my kingdom. We say it. We say the Lord's Prayer, but often we say it so quickly that we forget it is a radical prayer requesting that God use us. That I am actually asking God to use me, my life, my time, my money, my resources, all this stuff I call mine. He says, would you use it to make his kingdom come, which is so backwards, because if I'm honest with you, most of my prayers begin and end with requests for who? Me. And in fact, as I heard a speaker say one time that I tended to agree with in my life and yours, you make the decision. If all the things I prayed about came true, I would be the one who would be most blessed. And he starts out with a model of prayer that says, be different. Don't pray like that. And it's at this point that the prayer makes a dramatic turn from the, the glory and the presence and the hallowedness and the, and the your kingdom and the your power and the your name to me. And it's funny that in the, the middle of this prayer is where we see a turn from surrender. Because that's what your kingdom is all about. When we pray, your kingdom come. When we pray, hallowed be your name. When we pray, your will be done. It is asking God to help us surrender our lives to his lives. Father, I surrender my name being known to your name being known. Father, I surrender my will being done to your will being done. Father, I surrender my kingdom coming. To your kingdom coming. And the prayer makes a drastic shift from the recognition of who Father is and what Father can do to what I need. And in a funny sort of way, what Jesus teaches us to pray in the middle of this prayer is usually where my prayers start. Which is often with the word, give. Any of your prayers kind of start that way once you get past the, you know, dear Jesus or dear Father... <laughs> It goes to what I need. Give, Matthew 6, 11. It's like finally we are at the asking part. Finally we are at the giving part. Because Lord, give me because I got a lot of wants. I got a lot of, a lot of things I would like to have out there. Like, you know, I pass those. How many of you pass those uh, bulletin boards that now, you know, they're like digital. And they, they keep up with how much money is, you know, you pick the right numbers and they're there. And how many of you sometimes like, may forget that there's like a 200 billion chance that you might ever get one. And you, but you dream, what if I did get one? You know, you're praying for that vision. God, give me the vision of the numbers and then God give me the God give me the the wisdom to go in and buy at the right station at the right time or God you just pick them this is a quick pick for you God you know <laughs> I'm like because a lot of times my prayers go there God I just like a quick pick you just like lay it out there put it on me I am ready for it how about that hot date how about some good grades but the three things that Jesus is about to tell us that we should pray for ourselves that he wants to give us are three whether you realize them or not, three of the greatest needs we as human beings have. He says, when, when you're going to say give, when you get to the word give, he says, the things I want to give you are the things you need the most. And then he labels them out, give us our daily bread. Give us the bread that we need. Give us the stuff that we need for today. Give us forgiveness. That you forgive our debts. And as we'll see next week, it is a conditional clause as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Father, would you give us deliverance? Would you deliverance from evil? And I wonder if in our lives we would be happy with just those three things. I wonder in our lives if we could learn to be content. If Jesus gave us just those three things, if those were the things we asked for, would you give me bread for today? 
Would you give me forgiveness and allow me to forgive those other people in my life who have done things to me? Would you deliver me? Would you keep me from evil? And if you look at those, they cover every gamut of our lives, don't they? He covers our our physical needs with give us this day our daily bread. He covers our spiritual and relational needs when he says forgive us of our debts. So you know it's, it's this vertical relationship with him. It's this horizontal relationship with each other. As I forgive the people here, Father, would you forgive me? Would you deliver us? What should be the deepest desire of our heart? Would you deliver me from any evil? Would you keep me from anything that would keep me from putting you first place in my life? And while the first part of Jesus' prayer, your name, your kingdom, your will, is all about complete surrender, the last part of this prayer is all about complete dependence on God. And he words it like this, give us this day our daily bread. Now be honest, how many of you would be happy if this morning when you got up you only had enough to eat for today? How many of us would really be happy if that's what we had? If that's all we had? We would probably be angry with God in a world of more. Having only what we need for today is not really how most of us think about living. Because most of us, if we think about it, have never worried about where our next meal will come from. I know that's not true exclusively. That we have people and that we work with people every day who sometimes wonder. But for most of us who fill this room, most of us who will be viewing online today, most of us don't worry about our daily bread. In fact, most of us probably eat more than one meal than the rest of the world eats daily. It's not something that we think about. Our freezer went out a few weeks ago and I think we lost a whole month of daily bread and... Everything that was, that was in there, but this phrase, give us today our daily bread, is an expression of ultimate dependence on God. And it seems that Jesus, as you look and as you read through this prayer, wanted us to be cognizant, not of a, of a type of dependence on God when, when I have a need just th- that, that I remember or that I think about or when something comes up in life that I can't handle. But he wants us to have this daily walk, this, this day-by-day conscious dependence on him. It is before my feet hit the ground every single morning, realizing that, Father, I want to get out of bed with the following attitude. Would you show me my assignment for today, God? Would you lead me to the people I need to be led to today, Father? Would you lead the people my direction who I need to help today, Father? Would you show me where to go? Would you show me what to do? Would you give me the words to speak? Would you give me wisdom? Would you guide us? Would you close any door, Father, that you don't want me to walk through? Would you open any door, Father, that you want me to walk through? It is asking God for my daily bread. It is declaring my utter dependence on Him. And for the people in Jesus' audiences, audience that day, you know what they would have thought of with this phrase, daily bread? Their minds would have immediately went back to the days of their ancestor because that's what they retold at Passover every single year. They retold the story of their deliverance from Egypt and how they were just a, a few months out of Egypt and they began to complain and they began to, to gripe that they didn't have the food that they had in Egypt. And they, they go to Moses and they go to God and uh, the tent of meeting and they're like grumbling and complaining, you know, we wish we had food to eat. When we were in Egypt, we had food. We ate leeks and onions by the Nile and all of a sudden they forget 400 years of slavery, leeks and onions by the the Nile, a moment of their hunger pains made them forget 400 years of bondage. So God goes to Moses and he says, you tell the people. He tells the people who are grumbling, the people who are complaining, that I'm going to give them bread. Exodus 16, God sends something that they end up calling. Anybody remember? Manna, that's right. You know what manna meant? What is it? That's right. You're exactly right. They walked out. They said, what is it? And, and in their language, manna meant what is it? So it was really, if we were naming it today, we would be like, what are you eating? Well, I'm eating what is it? Like nobody knows what it is. And then, uh, and since they didn't really know what it was, uh, Exodus tells us, it says it was like coriander seed. It was like a wafer dipped in honey. Now that sounds kind of, it was like Ritz bits on steroids to me. And so I, I think it was because I love Ritz bits and I love honey in there. And I love it crumbled up on anything that, that my wife makes. And he, he goes, he he said, it's the bread that they're sitting in you. And he said, and for six days, you go out and you gather only what you need. But did they do that? Well, a lot of them did, but some of them didn't. Some, some of them hoarded. Anybody remember the days of COVID? <laughs> Anybody hoard anything in here? 
Anybody have more toilet paper in your house than you needed for the... Because <laughs> you were the reason Sam's was out and Walmart was out and Target was out because we looked in your garage and there it all was and, and, and we, knew, we knew where to come. He, he says, you know, the reason we hoard, the reason we hoard is because sometimes we have trouble trusting God for our daily bread, isn't it? We have trouble trusting that he's going to come through for us. Well, then they're, they're out in the, the desert and they're having trouble trusting all these things. And he says, six days, six days you gather only what you need. On the sixth day, you can gather enough for two days for the seventh. It was a reminder of their daily dependence on their Heavenly Father. Every morning, you don't have to ask for it. You don't have to hunt for it. You don't even have to look for it. All you've got to do is roll out of your tent, put your head face down on the ground, and start chewing. And there it is, this honey seed stuff that tastes like a Ritz Bit cracker. Anyway, I added that part. And in this story, there is this principle that is often overlooked in our society and it's often overlooked in a land of plenty. And I would say that we live in a land of plenty. And the principle is this, having much can often make us forget how much we depend on our Heavenly Father. Having much can often make us realize how much we actually do depend on our Heavenly Father it is the danger of having plenty, or as Jesus called it, it is the deceit of riches. In fact, Moses is going to remind the people. He says, there will come a day when you don't grumble about food. There will come a day when you don't complain about having shelter. In fact, there's coming a day when you have more than you ever dreamed you would ever have. There's coming a day when you will dwell in cities you did not build. You will live in houses that you did not provide for yourselves. There's coming a day when you will eat from vineyards you did not plant and you will drink from wine that you did not grow. You will drink from wells that you did not dig. You will eat and you will be satisfied. And Moses says that God's warning for them was this. When that time comes, don't forget God. Because Moses knew that the greatest temptation in a world of plenty, the greatest temptation in a world of much, is to start thinking that we cause the plenty and we cause the much and we no longer depend on our Heavenly Father. And he warns them and he says, In that day when your refrigerators are full and your cars are in the garage and you have clothes in your closet, do not be deceived. In your days of plenty, you have as much dependence on God as you do in your days of want. If you don't believe that, take one commodity that God gives us away and think how long we would live. Try holding your breath. Try holding your breath for just the few minutes that I talk. See how long many of you can do it. Some of you may last 15 seconds. Some of you may last a minute. Some of you may last two minutes. But going much past two minutes, most of you are expired and kind of you're a movie that's uh, out there because you're just laying across the, the seats where you are. Because you see, the tendency in the people who live in a world of more is to think the more food I can eat, more clothes I can wear, more money I can spend, I have more than enough. And the biggest danger is I forget that if God were to withhold even one thing, my money would make no difference. That if the only thing he took away in this moment was the air that we breathe, that nobody's money in this room would make a hill of beans to anybody. Not the places we live, not the places we come from, not the greatest minds in this room would mean a single thing. And the power of this part of the prayers and reminding ourselves that in every part of our lives, down to the very meals we eat, everything we have comes from the hands of our Heavenly Father. Several years ago, when I stood in a doctor's office with my wife Linda and heard the word cancer, I was reminded of how little control I have. It wasn't so much a, what am I going to do next moment, as it was a, God, can you take care of this moment? Maybe I could pay for a good doctor, but in the end, I realized my dependency on God. I, I go back 30 years of my life to the time that my daughter was born and Three days into her birth, she weighed a whopping one pound, 13 ounces. My, my wedding ring that I have would go all the way up to her shoulder, although I only had the opportunity to do that one time because she spent the next eight weeks of her life in, uh, in a place where we could neither touch her nor hold her. And as we left the hospital that night, I realized how little control 
we actually have. Or maybe you've stood at the casket of someone that you love, at the funeral service of someone who was close to you, and you realize all the money, all the stuff in the world, and if we're not for a daily dependence on a Heavenly Father who, as we will proclaim in two weeks, is the resurrection and is the life, I would be nothing. And it's in those moments that I realize that I have very little control over the things that I love the most. Ironic, isn't it, that in this simple prayer, Jesus is reminding us to remind ourselves to not forget where our stuff comes from and that we should live every day, every moment of our lives, whether in plenty or whether in want, in complete dependence on Him. Over the past two weeks, Trent has talked to you about Solomon, one of the wisest men who ever lived, who, who when faced with the choice of what would I choose, wisely chose wisdom. And in Proverbs 30, verse 8, he said these words, Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty. Now, that's a prayer most of us can willingly pray, isn't it? I don't want poverty. Give me neither poverty. But the next part of the prayer is tough. Nor give me riches. Nor give me riches. But give me only my. And what do you think Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, would say? Give me only my 700 wives. Give me only the, the cedars of Lebanon that have been brought in. Give me only the gold that has, been, that has been laid at my disposal to build the temple. Give me my riches. No, Solomon will at the end of his life look back and say, but give me only my daily bread. It is this sudden realization from, from, from Solomon. He gets, you know, a few chapters later to the end of his life, and he looks back and he says, everything that I strived for was a chasing after the wind was meaningless. Don't give me poverty. Don't give me riches. But only my daily bread. Why would the wisest man who ever lived say to live that way? He tells us in verse 9. Otherwise I might have too much. And he knew the dangers of having too much all too well, didn't he? And I might disown you and say, who is the Lord? Do you think he's speaking from personal experience? That I can look at all the stuff I have, all the stuff that has come my way, and because of all of that, I might say, who is the Lord? Solomon says, been there, done that. On the other side, he said, if I have too little, well, I might become poor and still. And so dishonor the name of my Lord. And I don't want to do that. Don't make me rich, Father. I know the dangerous to forget and that I still depend on you. And don't make me poor, Father. I might be tempted to steal and bring dishonor to your name. I wonder what would happen if each of us, as we leave here today and go out in this world, live with that prayer. I wonder if it's even a prayer that we would have the courage to pray. In a world where climbing the ladder is the next best thing in the business part of wherever I am. In a world where having a, a better car, a nicer house, or whatever it is that, that we all, including myself, enjoy. I wonder what it would be like if I just simply said, Father, give me neither riches nor poverty. But only what I need to live for you today. To be your man on earth today. To be your woman on earth today. Father, please don't give me anything that would make me turn my eyes from you. And don't give me anything that would make me want to take from someone else. Would you give me what I need to live today? In the Gospel of John, and that's where we're going to close today. Uh, um, John chapter 6. Uh, Funny little fact, the longest chapter in, in the New Testament. In John chapter 6, it's, it's an action-packed chapter. If most of you know there are seven I am statements of Jesus in Scripture that speak to his deity. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the gate. All of those things. Well, he makes a statement in John chapter 6 where he uses this word bread. He says, I am the bread of life. And John chapter 6 opens up with this miracle that is really a turning point in the life and the ministry of Jesus. It's the feeding of the 5,000 as we know it. Actually, 5,000 men, a lot of scholars believe, probably fifteen to 20,000 people there that day when you count the women, you count the children. 
And all of the people who are following Jesus, I mean, they are excited. The crowds are there. You know, if you got 15,000, 20,000 people out in front of you, wow, it's a good day. And, and if you want to read John chapter 6, you know, they get a little boy's lunch. And nobody knows what's happening except the disciples and perhaps this little boy. And Jesus is blessing it. And, you know, he's bowing his head. And I don't think any of the disciples got their eyes bowed. You know, every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't think their heads were bowed. I think their eyes were wide open. Like, what's he going to do? He's got a few loaves and a few fishes and he's blessing it and we're going to tell the people to sit down and eat I mean be like me coming here with a muffin and saying hey y'all get ready we're going to feast I got a muffin and you know and <laughs> you know I don't know they don't have a clue about what's about what's going on but the, the miracle happens they feed all of that they got more than enough for everybody it's all left over and uh, it says that the people ironically they, they want to forcibly take Jesus and make him their king but Jesus knows something about the hearts of the people. He knows that often in a world of plenty, in a world of excess, that it's easy to fall in love with the stuff more than the provider of the stuff. And so Jesus escapes from their attempt to take him and make him a king. And he goes up on the mountain. And it's this time that his disciples, they get in a boat. It's evening and they go to the other side. But the, all the people, all the 15,000, 20,000 people, they're still there. And they just know that Jesus kind of disappeared in the mountainside. And they see the disciples take off in a boat. So they stay there all night. But as you know, as things would go, they fall asleep. And in the middle of the night, Jesus goes out walking on the water. You remember that story still in John chapter 6? He walks on the water. They have this incredible moment. You know, uh, one of the other writers, John, doesn't tell us because I I think John's a little bit jealous of Peter at this point because Peter actually walked on water. But anyway, John doesn't tell us you got to go somewhere else to read that Peter said, Lord, is it you? Can I come out? And Jesus said, yeah, it's you. Come on out. And he, and he comes out, and, you know, and he has this moment where he walks on water. And often we remember the sinking part, but I remember the walking part. Can you imagine going to that history? He said, man, I stood on top of the Sea of Galilee with Jesus. Anyway, they have this incredible moment, and Jesus gets in the boat with the disciples, and immediately they are at the other side. <laughs> They're where they needed to be, which is a whole message in and of itself that if you just let Jesus in your boat, you, you, you're where you're going. <laughs> that if you just, all you got to do is open up, let him in, and, and you're there, man. <laughs> Well, that's what happens. He lets them in there at the other side. But all of a sudden, the 15,000 people over here, they wake up. And they go, where's Jesus? Where are the disciples? Well, word comes back from this side of the Sea of Galilee. Well, he's in Galilee. And they're over here thinking, well, how is he in Galilee? I mean, he was up on the mountain. His disciples got in a boat. We didn't see him. But well, we don't care how he got over there. They get in a boat, and they go over there to get with him. <laughs> and so when they get over there to get with him, Jesus sees them coming. And he looks, and he says these words in John chapter 6. He says, Truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Hmm. Truly, I tell you, you were looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed. And I'm thinking, but they did see the signs you performed, Jesus. I mean, they not only saw the sign, they ate the sign. <laughs> they ate and had their fill and everything. What's he talking about? And in that moment, I think Jesus is saying, do you think it's possible to see the sign, to see the miracle, but miss the provider of the miracle? Do you think it's possible to live in a world of plenty and get so enamored with the plenty that I have that I actually forget the one who gave me the plenty, that I forget the miracle that brought it in the first place? It says Jesus looked at them, and it's in that context that, uh, that he says if... If, you know, they even said, they said, well, why do you not want to feed us anymore? And Jesus said, it's not that. And they say, well, you know, it could be that because our ancestors, they had manna in the wilderness and, and God fed them and Moses fed them there. And Jesus looks back and says, make no mistake about it. Moses didn't feed your ancestors in the wilderness. God did. And I am the bread of life that has come down from heaven. And in this incredible moment, they look and they say, well, give us that bread. But they really don't mean it. They really still just kind of want the stuff. And, and Jesus looks at them and he says, don't you realize I am the bread of life? You're looking for something to eat. <laughs> I'm looking to give you some body. <laughs> some body that's there. And I think all of that is kind of wrapped up in the statement, give us our daily bread. It's not just a request for God to give us the things that we need. It is a request that if I didn't have him, I would have nothing. It's the realization that even if he doesn't answer my prayer the way I want him to answer my prayer, if I'm walking daily with him, well, I got something that nobody can take away. 
If he doesn't answer my needs and my wishes, my want list that I have. He, he doesn't say don't give it to me. He says give it to me. But he says never fall in love with the gift. More than you fall in love with the giver of the gift. So when you pray, you can pray. <laughs> you can pray and how about saying, God, you know, I can give, you know, I, I can give you, I can give you my life. Getting up every morning and saying, Heavenly Father, here are my hands, here are my feet, here are my legs, my mind, my eyes, my resources, my pain, my joys, everything I'm going through, Father, today. I am all yours. Would you give me, Father, today the things that I need? Nothing more, nothing less. Just what I need for today to be your man, to be your woman on this earth. Nothing more, nothing less. Or maybe we could pray it the way Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me for today the daily bread that I need. With this knowledge that the bread is not just what I take in substantively. That the bread that he's offering is the bread of himself. Take me in. And when you got me in your boat, you're where you need to be. Father. I pray that in a world of plenty, we will live as people in a world of want. That, Father, as you said at the beginning of this service, the sermon, that we will always be a people who hunger and who thirst. Not for the things this world can give us, but, Father, for you and you alone. Father, you are the good shepherd. You are the way. You are the light of the world. You are the truth. You are the life. You are the door. You are the keeper. You are the vine. And Father, you, <laughs> Father, you, you are the bread of life. Help us, Father, to feast on you. And the whole church at Northfield said, Amen. Amen.